All right, hi everyone. So this is the second part of just a physiology primer for the upcoming resident teaching night on June 16th. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today, just to build on the concepts from the last time, is to talk more about the pituitary specifically. And then also we're going to talk about electrolyte and toxin filtering in the kidney. So let's start off with the pituitary. So again, as a reminder, the pituitary is a hormone producing structure in the brain. It's extremely small. And so in this diagram, I've just blown up the pituitary here. And this is a small pea-sized organ. And it's attached directly to the brain. It's attached to the hypothalamus of the brain. Now, the hypothalamus is sort of like the master controller of the hormones that are released from the pituitary that then go and act on all of the different endocrine glands in the body. So there is two uh, structural components of the pituitary, the anterior and the posterior pituitary. So the posterior pituitary is actually just a continuation of nerve endings, which have their axon endings in the posterior pituitary. And those axon bonds, as we call them, actually hold on to the hormones oxytocin and EDH. Now, just to quickly talk about each of these, oxytocin is an important hormone in the uh, fertility. So specifically in females, oxytocin will be released in periods like delivery uh, of a child at the end of pregnancy or during lactation. And basically these promote smooth muscle contraction. And there's some complex interplay, but oxytocin is a little bit unique in that when you release more oxytocin, it actually has a positive feedback mechanism which causes the posterior pituitary to release even more oxytocin. Now, in the anterior pituitary, signaling from the hypothalamus works a little bit different. So what you can see here is we actually have some venous plexus, which means that there's this complex and unique venous drainage that comes directly from the hypothalamus and leads into the anterior pituitary. So this creates very effective and direct signaling from the hypothalamic hormones to the anterior pituitary hormones being released. That means that you just need super small amounts of these hormones released by the hypothalamus, which will then perpetuate a larger response by the pituitary, which will propagate a systemic response. So the clear thing that we want to keep in mind with the pituitary is keeping in mind where these hormones are produced but also just the structural function of the pituitary, which can give us clues that something's going wrong with it. So the pituitary sits in this bony structure called the cella turca. And so this is a very well protected part of our body. And this bone is usually helpful for us, but if we have significant enough trauma, then we can actually have shearing of these bones and damage to our pituitary stalk that leads down from the hypothalamus. We also have a very closely associated sphenoid sinus, and that's why when we are doing surgeries on the pituitary, we actually do a transphenoidal approach because it is so close and we can approach through the nasal sinuses. Now, the other structures that are incredibly important um, to remember that are near the pituitary is the optic chiasm right here. So this is where the two optic nerves from each side cross over, and they actually integrate the visual information in our environment in a very specific way. What this means is that the pituitary, if it were to have a mass growing in it, it would push on the optic chiasm in a way where you would actually lose your peripheral vision. And so we call this uh, uh, a lateral hemianopsia or peripheral hemianopsia. And that is very uh, pathognomonic for a pituitary lesion, causing compression and dysfunction in the optic chiasm from a midline. Now, the other structures that are important that go through this area is we have cranial nerves three, four, and six, which control your extraocular muscles. So the muscles that move your eyes around, there's six of these muscles and three nerves that control them. Now, these go right through that cavity that the pituitary sits through lateral to the pituitary. So if you have a growth in the pituitary that goes out lateral and causes compression, you can actually get abnormal eye movements and palsies in these cranial nerves. The last thing that can happen 
is that because this is just a isolated system or a, a system that's closed, does not allow easily pressure to be released. If we have a growth, we can increase the pressure in our head, which gives us a typical headache of increased intracranial pressure. If we have a growth that goes down towards the sphenoid sinus, we can actually have leak from the CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid, into our nose and we can have rhinorrhea of CSF. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is how a mass might particularly affect the function of the pituitary. So when we have a mass in the pituitary, we can actually have the anterior hormones taken out and they have a variable sensitivity to this type of injury. So the thing that goes out first is growth hormone that I've listed first, then FSH and LH, then TSH. Second last is ACTH, thank goodness, because if we don't have ACTH, this is actually something that could be potentially fatal with adrenal insufficiency. And then last that gets taken out is prolactin. Now, each of these have signals coming from the hypothalamus to induce pituitary hormone release at appropriate levels. The one exception is prolactin, which actually requires inhibition from dopamine in order to not be released. So when you lose hypothalamic signaling, you will actually have increase of prolactin, but you will have decrease of every other anterior pituitary hormone. Now, what can be this mass? Well, you can have congenital masses or non-secreting masses. The most common example would be a craniopharyngioma. And if it's large enough and early enough in someone's life that it starts impairing pituitary function, you have massive implications on growth and development. The other uh, masses that can happen are actually secreting adenomas, the most common one being a prolactinum. The other two clinical entities that are most common and would be worth knowing about would be an ACTH secreting pituitary adenoma. This is also known as Cushing's disease, which causes a cushionoid phenotype and manifestation with signs and symptoms of Cushing's. And then the other one that is relatively more common than the other uh, pituitary adenomas is a growth hormone producing adenoma. Okay, so let's talk about the effects of some of these that we haven't talked about yet. So let's start off with the growth hormone. So growth hormone has many different effects, but it's released in a pulsatile fashion from the pituitary, which means that there has to be another organ that responds with something that has a longer half-life and longer biological activity to help with growth. And it helps with growth in the main areas that you could think of when we're primarily growing in our lives. So growth hormone is critical in childhood. When we don't have our bones fused, we still have growth weight. So it causes growth in height and it causes general hypertrophy of tissues. Growth hormone is sometimes used um, as a uh, substance uh, that you can take for performance enhancing or body modifying effects. Um, but the thing is, is that growth hormone is not typically needed in adulthood. It's controversial whether it should be replaced in adulthood. In childhood, it causes normal growth. Now, if you have excess production of growth hormone, say from a growth hormone producing adenoma, if this happens when the bones have growth plates that have not fused and have not completed growing, we have normal growth type. So the you know, characteristic of the growth as in growth in height it stays the same, but it happens to a degree that is abnormal. And this is gigantism as we call it. Now in adulthood, if you have a growth hormone producing Abnoma, this causes acromegaly with a typical soft and hard tissue feature. So the bones cannot grow in height, but they grow in thickness and density. And this can be particularly noticed with facial features as well as features in the hands. Now, what is the consequence of having too much growth hormone as an adult? When well, you get these acromegaly features that we can pick up on, and of course can be impairing to someone's health, but it also increases the risk of diabetes because Growth hormone is one of the counter-regulatory hormones for blood glucose to raise it up. And it also increases the risk of colorectal cancer because it causes the uh, colon uh, epithelial cells to increase in their rate of 
uh, division and increases the rate of mutations in cancers. Is this something that needs to be screened for? So this is growth hormone. Now, why don't we talk about ACTH? And we've talked about adrenals a little bit already. But the key thing to keep in mind with ACTH is how it influences the variable functions and hormones that are affected in the adrenal gland or are produced in the adrenal gland. So we have TRH, the hypothalamic uh, hormone, which induces ACTH, but not only that, it also induces MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone. That's just because these two hormones are produced from the same gene. So if you're trying to produce more ACTH, by consequence, you're gonna produce more melanocyte stimulating hormone as well, which causes more melanin production in the skin and darkening of the skin. This doesn't look like a nice tan when there's abnormal levels of MSH. This usually preferentially affects the mucosal membranes and causes a very um, mosaic and uh, non-uniform darkening of the skin and increased skin tone. Now, once you have ACTH, the thing about ACTH is that it just stimulates the cortex of the adrenal, and it does this basically non-discriminately. Now, the reason the adrenal gland exists in a way where there's many hormones being produced is because all of the hormones being produced in the adrenal gland are actually forms of steroids. So the thing that's made first, or the building block of all of these steroids, are androgens. So androgens, sex steroids are produced in the most uh, 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 central part of the cortex. And here, what happens with the androgens is they're converted through enzymes to make other steroids with different biological activity. So the first thing that's made is cortisol. So the glucocorticoids, which primarily work to increase glucose as a counter-regulatory hormone. But it also has many other effects that we've talked about. Cortisol will be something that facilitates vasoconstriction. Cortisol is also required for aldosterone activity in the distal nephron. So it's a very important stress hormone that sustains our basic physiological processes. Now, cortisol is the steroid that's produced in the cortex that is actually sensed by both the hypothalamus and by the pituitary to have negative feedback and regulate the levels of adrenal hormones in the body. The next thing that's produced for a steroid is a mineral corticoid. Mineral corticoid primarily has effects of changing electrolyte handling, and in aldosterone's case, potassium handling in the distal nephron. As you can see, if you have a block in making these later downstream steroids, then you're going to have accumulation of certain steroids. And if you cannot make cortisol, then you will not be able to have negative feedback to the pituitary and you will produce excess adrenal hormones. One example of this is congenital adrenal hyperplasia, in which there is a genetic change in the enzyme that converts androgens to cortisol. And it stops at a midway point and we have accumulation of 17-OH progesterone, which we can measure in the blood serum. But we will also get accumulation of all of the other upstream steroids, including androgens. So this can cause virilization or hypermasculization in males and ambiguous genitalia or ambiguous sexual features in females who are genetically female biologically. Now, the adrenal gland also has epinephrine being released from the medulla, and this is controlled separately, just to remember. So this is just like a sympathetic nerve that is postsynaptic and specialized, and it's a large reservoir for catecholamines in the human body for when we need a bigger release of catecholamines. Now, for the adrenals, what we want to do is we want to talk about some of this kidney handling. So we're going to talk about how cortisol and how aldosterone can affect the kidney next. So let's talk about electrolyte. So for electrolyte handling, the first one to start with is sodium. So sodium handling in the body is really a misnomer. What we care about is water. 
right? We want to make sure that we have adequate amounts of water and fluid in each compartment of the body. So sodium is the most abundant positive ion in the body, and it's balanced out by chloride. We generally are positively or negatively charged on average in our whole body. And that's why we don't get shocked when we ground ourselves. So sodium is basically just the key thing that comes along with water. You cannot have distilled or purified water in your body, it doesn't work. So we need to have some osmolarity and we use sodium primarily as the thing to help regulate and to sense how much water we have in our body. So whenever you're thinking of sodium, you're thinking of how much water there is, how big of a pool, and how many solutes are in there. And that's the key to remember. The two major factors that help us regulate our sodium levels is how much water we're bringing in and how many solutes we're bringing in. Not even necessarily specifically sodium, but of course, sodium is an important one as well. Now, the two factors that control how much concentration of sodium we have in our serum is how much we're taking in. But just remember that water is much, much more important than how much salt. We have a lot more range of sodium in terms of high and low levels that can influence um, uh, or that we can tolerate in terms of ingestion before we get a change in our sodium. Whereas with water, when we take in pure water or no water at all, we usually have much quicker changes in our sodium levels. And this is in part the way that our body responds. So something that happens for intake is thirst. And thirst is just usually induced by either higher sodium levels, so hypernatremia, or RAS activation. The body sensing, for whatever reason, that it does not have good intravascular volume and effective arterial blood volume. So what we're going to do is we're going to listen to salt cravings that we have, listen to thirst, and try to go into our environment to get enough intake of water and solutes at appropriate levels. But of course, this can go wrong. For example, with primary polydipsia, which is generally a psychiatric condition where individuals will over drink water despite not being thirsty. The other one, for example, is tea and toasters. Tea and toasters are individuals who have hyponatremia because they do not take in solute. Now remember, all that happens when you take in more solute is it increases the amount of water that you are able to tolerate and drink without lowering your serum sodium. So individuals who are tea and toasters are essentially just for a different reason having primary polydipsia. Now, the other thing that affects our sodium concentration, really the only way in the body that we can differentiate between holding on to just water or just sodium is RAS activation to the distal nephron. We are always going to have sodium come in and aquaporons that also allow water to flow down that sodium gradient. The exception is the aquaporons that go into the distal collecting duct in the nephron. So here, what happens is that we have very little or only very specific ion transporters in the collecting duct. Yet, we have a very salty medulla that's been created by the loop of Henle, and we have aquaporins that can be put in to the collecting duct if ADH is activated. What that does is it pulls out just water back in, which lowers the serum sodium concentration. And we can see this appropriately. When someone's dehydrated, they usually have a mild hyponatremia, but it can also happen in many disease states. We might have a reduced effective arterial blood volume due to cirrhosis, congestive heart failure, uh, chronic kidney disease, and all of these will activate the RAS system and cause hyponatremia. We also can have ADH just, just inappropriate release, which can be due to many physiological factors, anything from head trauma where ADH is produced, all the way to just like pain peripherally, which causes a stress response and ADH release. Of course, you've learned about other ones like lung diseases that release ADH and specific other cancers that can produce ADH.
Now, the thing that you need is appropriate ADH, which we just spoke about, but also that distal nephron flow. So if you have poor distal nephron flow, it is going to be very difficult to utilize ADH. And this usually happens in disease states such as kidney disease or when someone is extremely dehydrated. And those are really the only two situations that we can see significant hypernatremia and a relative lack of body water. Moving on to potassium. So potassium is something that we keep in very low levels, just to remember in the serum, but we keep in high levels inside the cells, inside the cytoplasm. This creates a gradient, an electrical gradient um, and concentration gradient over the cell membrane, which allows us to depolarize cells. This is extremely important in neural functioning and muscle functioning, which is why when potassium gradient over the cell membrane changes significantly, one of the biggest worrisome thing is the effect on the myocardial contractility and arrhythmia that may not be able to produce adequate cardiac output and you have death and pulselessness. Now, potassium has three major processes in terms of how we connect it. Number one is intake. You could definitely not take in enough potassium and that is possible for someone who has restricted eating. In terms of taking in too much potassium, really, this is only the case when you have a disease state such as kidney disease. So in chronic kidney disease, you have poor glomerular filtration, you have poor distal flow, which means you have poor excretion in the distal nephron of the kidney, which we'll talk about in a moment. So intake, not as important piece. Now shifting, because there's a huge reservoir of potassium in the cells of our body, we can actually very quickly change the low concentration in our serum if we have shifted in or out of the cell. What maintains this gradient and tries to balance this gradient is the 3-sodium, 2-potassium ATPase transporter. So things that can influence this transporter is insulin will increases activity, which means there's more potassium being pulled into the cell and more sodium being brought out. What also does this is making the pH basic of the serum, so giving a, something that's basically like sodium bicarb. And then also by using beta agonism, something like ventolin that has a beta agonist effect, not only on the lungs and on the smooth muscle of them, but also on other cells of the body to induce this. So this will create all cells that can respond to these factors, and pretty much all cells have this, will increase the activity of the sodium potassium ATPase transporter and will lower the serum potassium. Now, don't forget that because we have a big reservoir, if we have a condition where we have a lot of cell rupture um, and cell lysis, then we can drastically increase our potassium, something like rhabdomyolysis. Um, lastly is excretion. So we want to be able to excrete enough potassium to keep the levels low in our serum. And the way that we do that is in the distal nephron through aldosterone. Now, aldosterone signaling is a little bit complex because it can respond to multiple things. It needs to be facilitated through a few different things. So when we have the distal nephron working normally, we have aldosterone coming to the principal cell putting that ENAC channel into the uh, apical epithelium. And then we have a sodium that can come out of the lumen and be reabsorbed. That creates a negative charge inside this lumen, which will allow potassium to just flow down that electrical gradient and be excreted further. We also can release hydrogen through this gradient. So you need aldosterone here. Aldosterone, in order to have activity, needs some cortisol. So if you have no cortisol whatsoever in your body, if you're adrenally insufficient, you can also see uh, uh, high potassium and sometimes low sodium. Now, in terms of other things that can affect this, you just have to go back up the pathway. So aldosterone, which is produced in the cortex of the adrenals, it is sensing potassium. So if you have a part of your adrenal, like an adenoma, that just you know, spontaneously produces and release aldosterone that's not sensing potassium, then you begin, can become hypokalemic and produce too much. You also have 
cortisol and androgens being produced from the cortex along with aldosterone in response to ACTH. So you need to have this ACTH from the pituitary, which again can be overproduced from Cushing's disease from an adenoma, or if you have hypopituitarism from like a mass, then this can also take ACTH, but luckily it's lower down on the list in terms of its sensitivity to that type of injury. Those are the main influences that we need. Now, don't forget, because this is a distal nephron problem, when you have poor kidney flow, like in chronic kidney disease, they tend to struggle with this distal excretion, which is why they have a very sensitive um, uh, uh, serum potassium to their intake. So in order to better excrete this, what we can do is we can give Lasix, which causes poor reabsorption in the loop of Henle, which means there's more distal flow, which means there's more opportunity for principal cell activity and for potassium secretion. We can also give something called k which is a resin that you eat and it binds the potassium in the stomach and in the gut and it doesn't allow it to be absorbed. So what we want to do when someone has abnormal potassiums is we want to make sure we protect the heart by giving calcium gluconate we want to shift the, the potassium in the short term back into the cells where it's safer. And then when we want to start excreting and losing our total body potassium by giving either k or Lasix in flows to increase distal nephron flow. Okay, last topic here. So the last topic that we're talking about is just the filtering of toxins. And there's really like a few to keep in mind that we'll talk about today. So first of all is the creatinine or the GFR. So this is again how much pressure is coming out or is felt and appreciated in the glomerulus to allow appropriate filtration. So this means that the filter has to be normal. And it also means that you have to have adequate pressure with intravascular uh, volume and control with the efferent and afferent arterial of, of the glomerulus, which is controlled through the RAS system primarily. Now, this is uh, something that we can utilize to measure the kidney function um, and the glomerular filtration is creatinine because it's primarily filtered through the glomerulus and not very much is excreted through transporters later on in later sections of the nephron. Now, something that is filtered here is nitrogenous waste compounds uh, like ammonia. And ammonia is very important in one of the jobs of the kidney, which is to modulate the pH or the acid content of our blood. So first, what we have is nitrogenous compounds that come through, and we actually have in the proximal convoluted tubule glutamine, which is an amino acid that can be separated into bicarb and then also ammonia. Now, ammonia has a few things that happen to it throughout the kidney. And, or throughout the nephron, I should say. And the only important thing to remember that is that you need a functioning whole nephron to have appropriate acid and ammonia handling in the kidney. And these two are closely related and we'll see why in a moment. So we have the loop of Henle, which converts ammonia uh, with uh, NH4 positive to NH3, so a neutral charge, which means that in the distal nephron, intercalated cells can utilize their activity to release more hydrogen, which then binds to NH3 and becomes NH4 positive. So this is like a reservoir of ammonia, NH3, in the distal nephron to allow further acid secretion in the distal nephron for any extra acid secretion that we need to do that hasn't been done in the glomerulus. Now, once we secrete that uh, acid, what we can do is create a bicarb and we absorb it, which is a basic buffer that our body needs. So in the proximal convoluted tubule, you get reabsorption of HCO3 that's produced from glutamine. And then again, this can be inhibited by a caponic anhydrase inhibitor diuretic. Then HCO3 can also be reabsorbed in the alpha intercalated cells in the distal nephron. So when we have acids that we secrete and filter out, it depends what type of acid it is. So there's a few different strategies. Some are very easily filtered from the glomerulus. Other ones like antibiotics and certain medications are actually secreted from the proximal convoluted tubule into the lumen. 
It's important to keep this in mind because this takes a lot of energy, which means the proximal convoluted tubule is susceptible to ischemia. And it also means that these cells might accumulate certain toxins when they're in really high doses, which is why some of these toxins and acids actually can cause acute tubular necrosis of the proximal convoluted tubule. Now, in order to secrete these acids later, you also need to reabsorb bicarb. And that's why we can get clues as to how the ammonia and acid and bicarb handling in the kidney is going by looking at things like what is the pH of the urine? If we're not reabsorbing bicarb, that means we probably are wasting it into our urine. If we are reabsorbing bicarb, we're producing more acids, secreting them, we have a more acidic pH of our urine. We can also specifically measure bicarb levels in the serum. And if we are not able to reabsorb enough, we'll be below the normal of 24. So it's important to keep in mind how some of these toxins are affected by specific components of the nephron and how those components of the nephron can be impaired by certain disease states. And we will see accumulation of toxins, acids, and loss of bicarb. This is something that is a big consequence of chronic kidney disease and poor kidney function in general and contributes to some of the manifestations that we see. Okay, I think we've covered everything that we wanted to. I hope you guys have a great session. Please reach out to me if you have any questions at all. Take care.